we were very fortunate to have a, a gentleman who's going to uh, tell us about what, what happened in, uh, in, in Europe. And it, it struck me that at, at this point, people like Gene Schultz are, are a national champion. <coughs> and so uh, I'm going to introduce you to Gene Schultz and he'll tell us about uh, his uh, experiences in the general patents <coughs> army in Europe. <coughs> Thank you very much, Craig. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you, gentlemen, this morning. And I, I'd like to tell you my story, or a couple of my stories. And uh, this is a presentation that I've been doing, been giving a lot lately. And uh, I, I talk mostly to school classes, lots of high school history classes. And in elementary school, I talk to students as low as the fifth grade. Even though some of the pictures you're going to see today are pretty gory and awesome to look at, horrible to look at, uh, it's amazing how these students uh, really are, are, are fascinated by uh, what they're seeing and hearing. And uh, it's, a, it's a story that I think has to be told uh, about the atrocities, for instance, that took place there in the, during the Holocaust. And so that's what I'm doing nowadays. Uh, we'll get to that later. <clears throat> Let me take my jacket off, okay? Sure, sure. sure. Since you are all sort of informal here. Okay. Uh, the title of my talk is General Patton's Ghost Court. And people often wonder, what do you mean by ghost corps? Well, the term ghost was a nickname given to my unit, the 20th Corps, and it was given to us by journalists who uh, said that the, the German High Command was confounded by the way our unit, the 20th Corps, was able to show up and disappear uh, quickly, and they couldn't find us sometimes, and we're just like ghosts. Anyway, that's the, the way it all started. So what we're going to talk about today is the exploits of the 20th Corps. Uh, as we uh, left the area of Normandy, went across northern France into Germany, <coughs> and then into Austria, where we met the Russian army on May 8, 1945. So let me introduce myself. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, I was born here in, in Coltonville, Wisconsin, and that's up there in the Wapaka County, not far from Green Bay and Appleton. <laughs> And uh, so I wasn't born on a dairy farm. I, my father was a farmer, and uh, our farm was right smack halfway in the city limits of Clintonville and half out of the city limits. So I was a farm boy and a city boy at the same time, I used to like to brag about. Anyway, that's the house I was born in, and that's the dairy farm. Um, and then I graduated from high school in May 1941, and you know what happened six months after that? December 7th, 1941, suddenly we were in the war when that Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. So the country was gearing up and uh, every, and a lot of my buddies in high school who, who had, we had just been out of high school a little bit of time, they were at, uh, at, um, joining the Navy or the Army or the Air Corps uh, and enlisting. And I decided I was going to wait till I was going to be drafted because I was pretty much interested in the U U.S. Army, but I was in that not that much of a hurry, I guess, because I was on a farm. So then you saw all these posters out there, which uh, had Uncle Sam pointing his finger at you and saying, "I want you for the United States Army." You old timers, you remember those photos. So I was inducted in the Army in January of 1943 and it, in Fort Sheridan. And we took aptitude tests there and 
uh, since I had taken typing in high school, that was quite unusual for boys to take typing in those days, uh, I scored pretty high on the typing test, and so they grabbed me right away and said, hey, we need you real bad to work in an office. So I was in a cadre of about 32 guys from Wisconsin and Upper Michigan, and we went out to California to uh, this camp, Camp Young. It's out in the desert. Is it, and it was called the Desert Training Camp, and this is a camp that was <coughs> set up by General Patton himself. Because at that time, the, fo the war was going on in North Africa, and this was a desert war. So uh, the United States had never fought in a desert in its whole history. So this was something new, and the, the War Department in Washington decided we need some desert training, and Patton got the assignment to go out to California to the Mohawk Desert, and he staked out this huge camp out there. And so that's where I was sent. And uh, here is what a raw recruit looked like in <clears throat> basic training. Our, our commanding general was, uh, commanding, uh, was General Walton Walker. Uh, at that time, we were called the 4th Armored Corps. To, to tell you what a corps is, uh, it, it's an administrative unit. It's under army, because at the, at the top level, you have army. And then each army has maybe three corps attached to it. And, uh, and in the corps headquarters where you have all the, the top brass, they're usually West Point people. And they are the ones who have the brains, and they are the ones who do all the planning and, and the, uh, and the gathering of, of manpower and all that kind of stuff. And then that's where the decisions are made for battle. And then that, that goes down to the division to the divisions who are at the front line. So General Walker now is the, our commanding general, and you may remember him as uh, the man who went over to Japan. He took over from MacArthur uh, when the war in Europe was over, and then the Korean War was going on, so uh, General Walker became commander of the 8th Army in Korea. Unfortunately, he was killed in a car accident. Uh, at the end of the year, I can't remember what year that was, 1950-something. <coughs> okay, uh, after basic training, then uh, uh, we got our assignments. And <clears throat> I was assigned to this colonel, Colonel Wilbur B. Griffith. He was the G3, and his job was to do the battle planning, planning the orders, and so on. And then my job was to type those orders. So here, a, a farm boy from northern Wisconsin was, was working for the top brass in here, and I was typing the orders. It's an amazing thing when I think back to what was happening. I was just a kid, 19, 20, 21 years old when I was in the service. And uh, I was privy to all this top secret information after we had gotten into con combat. Well, the, uh, the war in North Africa now was over uh, later in 1943, and so now all plans turned to Europe because that was the ultimate goal to get rid of Hitler. And so training now is going to change from desert training to a training in a, in a terrain very much like Europe. So we went to Camp Campbell, Kentucky, and we trained in Kentucky and Tennessee, which had terrain very much like Europe. They had hills and woods and, and rivers and ravines and things like that. And so that's the kind of training we had. That's why we went there. There you can see me on the left here peeling potatoes. And then uh, after a, a training all summer long, in 1943, uh, General Walker said it's time for maneuvers. So Tennessee maneuvers took place in September and October, about a 12 week, no, a 10 week period where we lived out in the field and in the woods and things like that. It's very intensive training, and we, had, we played war games, as they call it. But, uh, <clears throat> and then, after Tennessee maneuvers, General Walker said, okay, it's time for a furlough, and everyone go home on furlough, because get your affairs in order, because when you come back, you are going somewhere to a combat zone. 
So that is what happened. And so uh, I went home to Clintonville and uh, my whole family was there. We had never had a family portrait taken before. So there you see my mom and dad. And on the left, my brother Amos, my sister Gertrude and myself. After the furlough was over, it was time to go to war. So we went back to Camp Campbell and uh, right after Christmas, we, uh, oh, I was in January actually of 1944, we were headed for a combat zone. We didn't know at first where we were going, but when we got on the troop train, we found out we were heading east and we went through all the railroad stations and we could see the name of the station, the city. So we ended up in New York and so obviously we thought we were probably going to Europe, the European theater. So as we got off the naval ship in, the, in the Long Island Sound, and uh, actually we were in the Hudson River at that time, Pier 90, which is a famous pier. Got, I remember getting off the launch that morning, it was, it was in the night actually, maybe five in the morning, something like that. Uh, and I stepped onto the pier and I saw this ship <coughs> standing right there next to us. And I said, wow, is this like going to be our troop ship? And I looked at this and my, my head went up and up and up and up and up and wow, wow, what kind of a ship is this? And it turned out to be the Queen Mary. I said, wow, the Queen Mary. <coughs> well, I knew about the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth because that was always big news. They were the most elegant uh, liners going across the Atlantic Ocean, New York to South End. And in peacetime, uh, it's like the, the top picture shows here where the Queen Mary is, is covered in its gorgeous paint, the, the red uh, funnels. And uh, it, it carried about 2,200 passengers and a crew of about 1,000, so say uh, 3,500 people. Well, that was what it was, what it carried in peacetime. And it set all kinds of records crossing the, the Atlantic Ocean. Less than five days was the record, all by itself. Amazing. Well, so we're on this ship. <clears throat> we get on the ship. And of course, by that time, it was changed now to uh, a troop ship. And it got the nickname, the Grey Ghost. And you can see how it looked in the war paint. Well, when we got on the ship, there were a few more than 3,500 people, 16,000 of us. And as we got on board, <clears throat> we were given some instructions, and, and uh, uh, they said that we were going to cross the, the ocean all by ourselves. And we said, no, no, that can't be. We need a convoy. We need protection from the Navy, things like that. And so the answer was, no, no. If, if the Queen Mary traveled in a convoy, it would be a sitting duck. And uh, too dangerous, because it ha would have to go as slow as the slowest ship in the convoy. And they said, no, the Queen Mary will go all by itself. It will zig and zag. So that, that, means that, if, if you, that means that if you're traveling in a, a generally a slope in this direction, <coughs> the ship would zig and zag zig and zag like, I'm sorry, what am I doing here? <laughs> You're zigging and zagging. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Sorry about that. I gotta catch up here. <laughs> One more. Oh yeah, okay. Also, uh, there was only one-way traffic on each deck. Can you imagine if there <laughs> Yeah. What a what a mess that would be a tra traffic jam. Uh, each each deck was uh, given a, a letter a color, and you had to wear a tag which had the color of your deck red, white, or blue, or whatever. And if the MPs caught you in the wrong deck, you got fined. And uh, we ate two meals a day. That's all they had time for. But in between meals meals they <clears throat> had a, a couple of tables lined up where we could pick up sandwiches to hold us over. <clears throat> until the next meal. We did cross the ocean all by ourselves from New York to Scotland in five days. And we were very happy when we arrived near the coast of Ireland and saw this Sunderland 
patrol bomber. This is the British Air, uh, Royal Air Force's best uh, uh, submarine hunter that they had. And the ship came out, the plane came out to escort us into the, uh, the port. So here's a map now <coughs> of um, England and Scotland. Uh, you can see where we came around the northern coast of Ireland because <coughs> down here in the English Channel it was too dangerous for the, for the Queens or any ships to come here. It was covered by the Luftwaffe. So we came up there to Northern Ireland and we landed at Belrock, in, in, which is the port city of Glasgow. And <coughs> we got on a train after we disembarked. We went to Southern England to this town called Marlborough. Marlborough right here <coughs> in the Southern end of England. And so that is where we spent all our time until we went over to the Normandy beaches. <coughs> okay, Marlborough is about 70 miles, 80 miles west of London. It's in the Salisbury Plain. And so that's where we continued our, <coughs> our training again. We went on hikes every single day. <coughs> the hikes could be from six miles, eight miles, 10 miles, and we walked through the beautiful English countryside in those days. As you can see, some of the things we saw there, <coughs> the, these little villages with those uh, English thatched roofs, you know. And as we marched through these towns on our daily march, the, the women and children would come out and wave their flags and cheer us on. They were happy to see us there. Uh, <coughs> we were not far from Stonehenge. If you're familiar with Stonehenge, you know that's that ancient uh, site built by the Druids back about 3000 BC. <coughs> and uh, we climbed around those rocks, as you can see. <laughs> you can't do that today. If you go to Stonehenge today, there's a big fence around it. You don't go near it at all. But in those days, it was war. You could Is your name etched in it somewhere? Hmm? Is your name etched in it somewhere? Uh, not there. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I'm sure, yeah, where would have been <laughs> names etched there. Uh, okay, now why were we in England? England was filling up now with millions and millions of troops. It was a huge depot for ammunition, for fuel, for uh, aircraft, for tanks, for trucks, everything military. <clears throat> and this is why we were there, because this is the enemy we faced. There's these two pictures. Um, I found in a schoolhouse in Germany later on. They're, they were used for propaganda. <clears throat> there you see Hitler and, Ger and Hermann Goering. <clears throat> Notice the big Nazi rally in the other picture, that was 1933, where uh, it, it's in front of the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. Thousands of people out there. Now Hitler was a guy who, very charismatic, kind of guy, and he had the German people in the palm of his hand. He was, a, he was a, amazing how he rallied the whole German population to his ideas, to his thoughts. But it was the Nazi party, it, they are the ones who, as I talk to you today, you'll find they are the ones who <clears throat> were really running everything and all the horrible things that were going on was strictly the Nazis. Those were the, the brainwashed people uh, that Hitler had on his side. Well, Hitler was born in this building here in Braunau, Austria. And uh, that's his book, Mein Kampf. It's my copy. It's even signed. <laughs> no, this is a book I found in the schoolhouse, too, and I brought it home as my souvenir. And of course, the logo of the Nazi party, this is that horrible, horrible logo that people hated so much. That's the swastika. Hitler was uh, mesmerized by the by this swastika. Uh, and so he adopted it as the logo of the Nazi party. <clears throat> what the swastika is, is actually a Greek cross with the arms bent. So if, if you straighten out those <coughs> arms, you'll have an actual cross. Now, those arms could be bent clockwise or counterclockwise, so you'll see them both ways. But anyway, that was that horrible logo of the Nazi party. 
Now Hitler built what he called the Atlantic Wall. A not, not a real wall, but it was a series of defenses that came here, that started here, down here uh, where France meets Spain, and all the way along the coast of, Sp of France in the Low Countries, and Norway way up to the top where Norway uh, hits Russia. So that was his Atlantic Wall, what he called it. And so you can see some of the defenses in some of the places. These were mainly coastal defenses because Hitler <coughs> thought that there would be invasions at most any place along this Atlantic Wall. So that was his protection for Germany. Here's another propaganda slide. This is a quote that Hitler made. He said, England is kind of in somewhere. Means England is no longer an island. So Hitler stood on the coast of Normandy, he looked across the channel to England, and he said, England, you are mine. You are no longer an island. You are going to be part of mine. And he almost accomplished that uh, during the Blitz, the London Blitz, which went on for three straight months. Every single night, London was in shatters. Uh, and um, suddenly, no people to this day don't know why he did it, but Hitler changed his mind. And he decided to turn to Russia. So he pulled the Luftwaffe away from England and went into the Russia. And that is, people wonder to this day why he did that. Because he almost had England to himself. England almost was over, over with at, during that blitz. But it, it didn't happen, fortunately for us. <clears throat> the years of... The years 19, 1939 to 1945 was called the Battle of the Atlantic. And this is when the German U-boats uh, were sinking Allied shipping left and right. Convoys were sent to the bottom of the ocean all the time. And you can see the tremendous number of losses that took place in ships and in, in sailors and in merchantmen, things like that. Uh, the Germans lost quite a bit too, as you can see. They also lost like 30 million, 30,000 sailors. Well, the reason that the Battle of the Atlantic was so su successful is due to this machine called the Enigma machine. And the Enigma machine was a, a, a thing used in, in commerce in Germany. It was invented in the 1920s. And Hitler decided, hey, this would be a good idea to use to communicate with our submarine commanders via code. And so the way the Enigma machine works is it's, it has a keyboard of a typewriter. And if you depress a key, let's say the letter S, if you look at the letter S there, when you depress that, a, an electrical signal goes through one of the electric cords underneath it, and it goes behind the machine and it spins some rotors. And as those rotors had numbers and letters on them. So wherever that rotor, wherever that pointer stopped, that would be the letter used in a code, inscription. And so <clears throat> this is how the system worked. And so the, the high command in Germany was able to send messages to the submarine commanders out in the Atlantic telling them where the convoys were. And so they formed wolf packs, and they went after these convoys, and they was, were sinking ships left and right. And no one could break the code. So Churchill decided that we got to do something about this, and he set up a, a, a place for the code breakers called Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park is about 50 miles north of London. I was there a couple of years ago. And uh, it's a fascinating place. It was a top, top, top secret place in all, of, in all of England. In fact, all the information you have about the Enigma machine and Bletchley Park today is, is, has only been released about 30 years ago. It was kept secret that, that long. So all the people who worked on this top secret project were not permitted to talk to each other or to their families. And many of them died and no one ever knew what they were doing. Uh, 
Churchill believes that after they broke the code here at Wesley Park, that it shortened the war by up to two years. And so here's, here's the way the system worked. You have this man, Alan Turing. He was a mathematical genius. He was Polish. He, he fled from Poland just before Hitler went, overran the country in 1939. He fled to England, and he, uh, he was the, the, the top uh, person in Bl at Bletchley Park. Uh, at Bletchley Park, they, they had huts, labeled Hut 1, Hut 2, and Hut 3, and so on, all over the place. Uh, around that mansion that you just saw. And this is where all the, the workers were working to try and break the code. The thing is the Germans uh, changed the code every 24 hours, one minute after, am I? Oh. Yeah, push it away a little bit. Oh, the other way. This way? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, they changed the code every 24 hours. So, uh, it was hard to keep up with them. Well, so here, and now you can see the back side of the Edmund <coughs> machine, and after a long time, they were able to, to break this code, and from then on, the, at war, the Battle of the Atlantic, more or less, well, it got much less, and fewer and fewer boats were sunk. This is the original computer at Bletchley Park. It covers a, wall, a lot of wall space there. And it's an amazing change from nowadays when you had these very tiny computers available. And this was a, the origin of it. So Alan Turing is considered the father of the modern computer. <coughs> um, another great place to visit is uh, the uh, <coughs> Churchill War Rooms in downtown London is an underground war. Uh, it's the underground where Ch Churchill ran the government, uh, and this was the briefing room there. Uh, he ran the government during the Blitz. And so this is an amazing place to visit. Uh, he actually lived there along with other government officials, and his wife lived there with him. Okay, now <clears throat> we'll come to D-Day, and that's coming up in a couple weeks. The anniversary of it. <clears throat> Actually, the 70th anniversary of this year. It's amazing. Uh, so, at that time, Eisenhower, who was the Supreme Commander, had his headquarters in London. And uh, about the middle of May, he moved from London to this place called Southwick. Uh, Southwick House in Ports Portsmouth. And Portsmouth now is near S Southampton. And that was on the coast, and that was where uh, many of the landings were going to take off from. So here is Ike and his, and his uh, team, and uh, so they moved over to <coughs> Portsmouth, and this was the briefing room in which uh, all the, the top secret briefing took place. And this is also the room where Ike made those famous words when he decided, okay, Let's go. That meaning that, you know, the weather was against them there. And, and actually, the landings were supposed to take place on June 5th, uh, but it was postponed for 24 hours to June 6th. So here we are now in uh, southern England. I'm showing you there the city of Marlborough. And 15 miles north of Marlborough is a city called Swindon. And here's where the American Air Base was where the 101st and the 82nd Airborne did their training. So, well, the training that was going on at Swindon was glider training, also paratroopers, but mostly glider, because every day while we were outside doing our marches or whatever we were doing, these, these glider planes were above us, pulled by the C-47, towed by the C-47. <clears throat> They, they, they practiced, so the tow plane would pull the glider and uh, then when they were air, airborne at a certain altitude, they cut the glider loose and then the glider pilot practiced landing. So that went on and on every single day. We looked up at them all the time and saw them. Uh, so it was a very commonplace thing. Well, 
Then what happened is that on the morning of June 6th, during, during the darkness, during the dark hours, the 82nd and 101st Airborne Division uh, took off and went to their drop zones behind the enemy lines. Uh, if I had a pointer here, I could show this better, but uh, see those two dotted lines coming here mm -hmm. to, uh, to Cherbourg Peninsula? Mm -hmm. uh, those, that's, where the, that's where the drop zones were. And uh, on the morning of June 6th, about two o'clock in the morning, we were awakened by the rattling of windows in our barracks and the ground shook and we heard a tremendous roar of engines. We ran outside and looked up in the sky and the sky was full of our planes, each one towing a glider. And we said, wow, this has got to be it. This, this morning has to be D-Day. And that's what it was. And so I still can remember and, and hear the, the roaring of these tremendous numbers of engines of all these planes taking off for France. Um, and so that shows you there the back side of it, but now at 6.30 in the morning on June 6th, you see these other arrows coming there uh, to the Normandy coast. There were five beaches. With the two on the left are Utah and Omaha, <clears throat> and those are American beaches. And then the other three are British, Gold, Juno, and, and uh, sword, sword. sword, yeah. The, the, the middle one, Juno, is actually a Canadian army that was uh, fighting alongside the British. So if you look now between Utah and Omaha Beach, <coughs> right here, uh, there's Utah and there's Omaha, and halfway in between, it's right here, is, is um, a place called Point to Hawk. Point to Hawk. And this is a, a, a cliff, as you can see, and it's, it's a 100 foot sheer cliff. And the, the ranger, one of our ranger battalions, had to go, go there and scale that cliff and knock out some big guns that were up on the top. They had to do that before 6.30 in the morning because that's when the landings were going to take place. Now, now the German guns, <coughs> the German guns on the top of this Point to Hawk were aimed at both Utah Beach and Omaha Beach and they, the range was equal and those guns could reach each beach. So the idea was you had to knock these guns off before the landings took place in Utah and Omaha. If you go there today, this is what you'll see. You'll see bomb craters, those are done by our bombers, constantly bombing that in the days before D-Day. <clears throat> and then you can see the underground bunkers uh, that the German army had built there. I walked across Utah Beach on D plus 46. D plus 46, the date was July 22nd, 1944. <clears throat> July 22nd was my 21st birthday. So on my 21st birthday, I walked across Utah Beach. <clears throat> this is what it looks like today. And I want you to pay uh, special attention to what the beach looks like. It is a beautiful sandy beach. The French people use this as their playground. It's a gorgeous area. And uh, as you can see, all you see there is a, like a big sand dune along the way. But inside the sand dunes like this, there were, there were clunkers built there to protect the place. If you go there today, this is the memorial built at Utah Beach, and you notice that the French flag, the American flag is flying right next to the French flag. If you go to, to the Normandy beaches today as an American, you will be loved. The Normandy people love America. And, and not so with other places in France, as you <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, but Normandy, no, because <clears throat> we are the, the guys who liberated them. The French people have also built these markers. <clears throat> and the one on the left shows you <clears throat> kilometer zero. This is the very first one. It stands on Utah Beach. 
And every five miles along the northern highway uh, through Normandy, you find these markers. The one on the right shows you marker 108, kilometer 108. Now, near the museum, which is there today at Yuta Beach, is this cafe. And I was there, I've been to, back to the beaches about three times. And the last time was maybe three years ago. I was with a travel group. And since I was the only World War II vet in the group, the uh, leader said uh, I should come with him into this cafe. <clears throat> I walked into the cafe and the owner was there and our, our leader told the owner that I was a veteran and walked across Utah Beach. The owner of the cafe handed me a, a pencil, felt tip pencil, and he said, sir, sign your name on the wall. And here you can see there are many names all over the wall, all over the table. And the only people who he allowed to sign the name is anyone who walked across Utah Beach, whether on D-Day or the days following. And so it was just a, a, an emotional thing for me. And if you look closely, just above my name there on the right, the second patch up, my unit, the 20th Corps, there it is. It was such a thrill. So after I was done signing it, this owner came up and gave me a big bear hug and he said in my ear, merci, merci. <laughs> and this is the way the French are in Normandy. Also, an interesting thing happened in this town called St. Mary Glees, which is six miles in, inland from Utah Beach. And during the night, this paratrooper came down in the darkness and he got caught on a steeple. And you can see up there, a, a, now, if you go to St. Mary Glees today, you will see this because they permanently have a parachute caught there, up there on the, on the steeple, and there's a mannequin hanging there. That is the soldier. His name was, for, I forgot his first name, but his last name was Steele. And he <coughs> hung there all night until daylight when the, the Germans saw him up there and they took him down, so he was alive. Uh, he, he did die later in, in combat, but anyway, that's an interesting story. And even the French people today uh, made this uh, stained glass window, which if you look closely, you can see paratroopers coming down in the stained glass. So that, that's how they're honoring us there. Okay, let's move on now to Omaha Beach. Omaha Beach is right here. Here's Utah, here's Omaha. And... Uh, at Omaha Beach, I did something wrong again here. Notice the difference. Remember Utah Beach, a nice smooth sand beach, just a sand dune. Look, at, look how different it is at Omaha. All these cliffs around this bay. And now this is what our troops had to climb when they landed in that morning of June 6th. They, they had to come across this bay, which was infested with underground obstacles and then they had to scale the cliffs. And that's why the, the death rate at Omaha was so high. So many soldiers lost their lives here because the, the terrain is so different. <clears throat> and and uh, the Germans had also done this. These are those beach obstacles that they put into the seabed in the bay at low tide. And these obstacles had uh, landmines attached and dynamite and at high tide, which when our landings had to play, take place at high tide, uh, they would scrape across these underwater obstacles and they would detonate the dynamite and the landmines and blow up. Uh, also, a lot of soldiers lost their lives by drowning. They never got to the beach, but uh, they drowned in the bay itself. It was a very costly morning that morning. <clears throat> and in these cliffs is where the Germans had these huge uh, uh, coastal guns, and they were just deadly to uh, everything out there. Now, we're going to the British sector now, and here at, uh, at Gold Beach, uh, their, their biggest beach landing, is where um, they built a, what they call the Mulberry Harbor. All the cities along the Normandy coast were bombed by our bombers before D-Day. 
So there were no ports uh, available for our ships to land and unload material and troops. All the ports were gone. So the British decided to build a temporary harbor called Mulberry Harbor. And in order to do that, they needed a breakwater. So here, is, here you see some caissons, and, and these were huge uh, caissons that were built in, in England, and they had a lot of air holes in them. And uh, after the bridgehead was complete in Normandy, they towed these things across the channel with barges. They towed them across, and then they made a semicircle here and, and sank them into the seabed and it became a seawall. And now ships could come inside of the seawall and they built a temporary floating dock. And now our ships could come in and unload and that's the way they solved that problem. Uh, also take, the, take a look at the size of the, of the German coastal guns that were there. The British also had a problem here, uh, or not a problem, but they wanted to save this bridge called the Pegasus Bridge. And if you go there today, you will see this bridge. This is the bridge that was across a canal. Uh, and it, it was uh, ready to be blown up by the Germans if they retreated. So it was wired with dynamite. Uh, and uh, in order to save that bridge, I mean, if, if they saved the bridge, they could save a detour of about 25 miles that they, they would have had to make to get to the city of Caen, France. So during the night of June 6th, three British gliders came uh, and landed there. Two of those gliders crashed. But this one, and this is the actual glider, it's on the site right now, uh, it landed safely within a couple hundred yards of the bridge. Incredible landing during, in the darkness of June 6th. And, and the, the troops jumped out and they were able to gun down the guards at the bridge and then they crawled under the bridge and pulled the wires apart so they saved the bridge. And of course that was a, a major victory that, that morning, during that night. Now at Omaha Beach is where we have our, our American cemetery. It is the biggest cemetery that America has overseas and it has 9,386 grave graves there. Uh, where these graves are, you, you, you can see, just beyond it, you can see the blue water of the English Channel. Right there is the cliff. That's the cliff up which our troops had to fight that morning. And so now right on top of the, this, uh, this uh, cliff here is where our cemetery is. And it is a gorgeous, gorgeous cemetery. I hope you can get there if you haven't. It is a hallowed piece of ground. Uh, you can see the uh, there are two gravestones here, which are the Star of David. That indicates that those are Jewish boys who are buried there. Sometimes you see this poignant uh, inscription. It says, "Here, here rests in honor, glory, a comrade in arms, known but to God." and so is an unknown soldier. <clears throat> it is a huge cemetery, and if you turn around and look the other direction, you will see the memorial that is there, and in the middle of the memorial is the statue, which signifies youth, because these are the boys who, who came up the cliff there. And again, the study group that I was with a couple years ago, uh, as I said, I was the only youth, a veteran from World War II, they asked me to lay a wreath at this cemetery, and I was deeply honored. A uh, very emotional thing to do. <clears throat> That's the wreath I, wreath I laid there. It was just amazing. Uh, <clears throat> they had a little cer ceremony there for us, because we were in a, a group of Americans, I think 32 or something in our group. They played our national anthem in the cemetery, and they played taps. What an emotional day that was. <clears throat> uh, also, the British have their main cemetery there at Ranville, and uh, there I also had the privilege of not laying a wreath as the British do, but they plant a poppy. And here's a red poppy on a cross, which I <clears throat> had the honor of, of placing in their cemetery. 
Okay, <clears throat> we're gonna move on. This is a map showing the, uh, the route of the 20th Corps uh, from England to, to France and all the way across France into Germany and then into Austria. I had a camera with me uh, as we travel along and these are my own pictures here showing some of the destruction in the Normandy towns that we went through on our way to Avranche and all the, the land now in Normandy here, which is above the yellow line that you see there, that is now the bridgehead. So from June 6th until August 1st, that period was a period of building the bridgehead. The, the, the combat across France did not officially start until there was enough material, enough troops, enough fuel, ammunition, whatever, in the bridgehead in order to have a sustained march. So on August 1st, 1944, in Avranche, the Third Army was activated. So General Patton was roaming around Normandy all these days, and he had nothing to do. He, he didn't have his command yet until August 1st at noon. And he started out by having a, a schnapps. Which he, <laughs> which he wrote in his diary. And also on August 1st, so the 20th Corps, since we were attached to the 3rd Army, we became active too. And here is General Patton. Uh, he's a man I saw frequently because he visited our headquarters a lot. We were one of his corps, and I even had an occasion to talk to him at one time, uh, briefly. But he was a great general, a military genius, if there ever was one. Uh, he was a, a tall, slim man, six foot two inches tall. And his trademark, of course, was carrying his pearl handled pistol on his belt. We, uh, we started out on August 1st and we headed toward Paris. <clears throat> and where that red star is, you can see that that's the city of Chartres. Chartres is uh, 50 miles from Paris and it's out in the uh, flat countryside there. <clears throat> this is a picture I took as we passed through Chart, and that's Chart Cathedral sitting up there uh, in the center of town. <clears throat> and uh, this is what it looks like today. Now Chart Cathedral was built in 1250 AD. It's one of the most beautiful cathedrals in all of Europe. It has these two twin, twin spires that are about 360 feet high and a beautiful rose window. And the view from the, from the towers up there is magnificent. But notice how flat the country is. So you can see for miles and miles. It's flat country like Nebraska because this is the breadbasket of France. This is the, where the wheat fields are. But you can see so far. <clears throat> My boss, Colonel Griffith, was in a staff meeting on the morning of August 16th, 1944. After the meeting was over, uh, he said to me, I'm going into Chart to, to check it out. I want to do a personal reconnaissance. Uh, I want to see what's going on. That's all he said. And so three hours later, we got a telephone call that he had been killed. He had been killed. And uh, it was a devastating blow to news to hear this and it was just a pall of grief and, and, and hanging over our headquarters and my, my boss the man I had been working for for 18 straight months suddenly was gone what had happened is <clears throat> that um, he um, and I didn't know this at the time I didn't know it just a few years later a few years ago he had heard in the staff meeting a troubling report that our artillery was zeroed in on Chartres Cathedral to shell it and destroy it because it, there, there was a rumor that there were German snipers up in the bell towers. And you saw what, what the view is from the bell towers. You could see for miles and miles. So the, <clears throat> the idea was uh, the snipers would have a pretty good view of American troop movements from that vantage point. So the colonel 
was troubled by this, the fact that the cathedral was doomed for destruction. So he went in to check it out. And he, he didn't find any cypress in the cathedral. So he left and he found one of our tank divisions and he said uh, to the tank driver, uh, let me ride on your tank and take, let's, let's drive through the city. Uh, and so they, they went into the city of the suburb of Shard called Leves, L-E-V-E-S, Leves, and, they, and that's where a, a, a sniper got him riding on the back of a tank. And he was shot and fell off the tank into the street. And he was dead. So I didn't know a lot of this information at that time. However, in the meantime, Colonel Griffith was buried out in the field, as they did with soldiers who fell because there was no formal cemetery yet. And, uh, but he was buried in a farm field like this. And in 1994, which was the 50th anniversary of D-Day, <coughs> I decided to take my wife over to Europe to retrace my military steps. We had been in 32 command posts, and, uh, and I found every single one. We had spent about six weeks roaming over these countries with a rented, with a rented car. I found out that Colonel Griffith was buried in a cemetery in Brittany. And this is uh, near where we started out, our country. <coughs> and uh, so here is the cemetery in St. James, France. It's got 4,400 graves. And I was, my wife and I were found his grave, and I, was, I had finally had a chance to mourn my boss. And this was 50 years later. So kind of a closing chapter on a part of my life, I, you might say. So. <coughs> I wrote a book, and I was just finishing the book two years ago, and I got to wondering, I wonder if Colonel Griffith had any family around. He never talked about his family. He was a very private man that way, and, but I was curious. So I went to the internet and started surfing it, and here I ran across an article called A Colonel at Chart. It was in the National <coughs> Review Online. Two words jumped out at me, Colonel and Shark. And so I read the article, and the, in the article, this man said, my wife's grandfather, whose name was Colonel Wilburn B. Griffith, is the one who saved Shark Cathedral from destruction. Wow, wow. I found something. This is, the, this is my boss. And so now how, how can I get a hold of that man who wrote this letter? So I wrote a letter to the National Review Online. I found who the editor was. I wrote him a letter and told him my story of working with Colonel Griffith for all those months and what I knew about him. And, and, and I think, well, let's hope for the best. I don't know what's gonna happen. Two weeks later, I got a letter in the mail from a lady in Florida. She said, dear Mr. Schultz, my name is Alice Griffith Irving. I am Colonel Griffith's daughter. Wow, wow, it worked, the system worked. And she said, I was a little girl only 13 years old when my father died. I hardly knew my father. And I, I'm eager to meet you. I want to hear more about what, what my father was like because you worked for him so long. So we made arrangements and she invited my wife and me to her home in Florida. And here she is. She lives in Jacksonville. She uh, is uh, 82 years old now, I believe. And uh, we had a wonderful weekend, and now we have sort of bonded with each other, you might say, because uh, I was able to fill her in on a lot of things about her father she didn't know. And she was able to tell me a lot of things I didn't know about him and, and what had happened. So now a new story unfolds. Alice Griffith told me that she had found a man in the city of Leves, France, the suburb of Chart, who had made a museum because he was interested in museums uh, or war type artifacts. And he had been, a, he was a little boy or age, an adolescent at the time 
the Americans were in check. And he lived in, his, in this town of Lives, and he remembered an American colonel getting killed on a street. And so he wanted to have a, a, a little room in his little museum there about Colonel Griffith. So he was looking for information uh, about the Griffith family, and I'll come to that in a minute. <clears throat> in the meantime, uh, this is what happened, is that uh, this man, his name was Monsieur Papillon, and he, uh, he produced this picture that was taken at the time the colonel died. And this is a picture of Colonel Griffith lying on the street. They covered his body with an American flag they found in their basement, which they had hidden from the Germans and they put flowers on there, and they see that chair standing there. They kept an overnight vigil over his body until the next day when our men could pick him up. Also, this man made a plaque, which he put on the building where the colonel had died. And in this plaque, it says uh, that at this spot on the 16th of August, 1944, the American colonel died, and he called him Colonel Welburn. He was confused as to what the colonel's surname was. He didn't know if it was Griffith or Welburn. And it, it, so he used Welburn, but he misspelled it and said Welburn. Well, that's another story. <clears throat> another thing that Alice Griffith told me is that she had received uh, uh, from France a journal, a journal that was written by a Catholic priest who happened to be in Chart Cathedral the morning that the colonel was in there. And here are a couple excerpt, excerpts from the date of August 16th, the day this priest was inside Chart Cathedral. And he talks about Americans racing through it and an American going up to the bell towers and so on. So in his journal, this priest wrote this and imagine that, he's describing Colonel Griffith who was going through the cathedral, and Colonel Griffith did go up to the, to the bell towers. And here, these are the stairs that the colonel would have had to climb up to get there, and that's the view that he would have seen when he saw that <clears throat> and found there were no German snipers up there. Then he called the artillery back and said, rescind your order to destroy the cathedral. So Sharp Cathedral stands today due to the her heroic exploits of Colonel Griffith. My loss. So he is a true hero. Now, Monsieur Papillon was also looking for information for the Griffith family. And so he writes a letter to America, and it found its way to St. Louis, where the personnel records are. <clears throat> they published a magazine there for Army officers. And in there, they had a, a want ad. It said, looking for information about a Colonel Wilbur B. Griffith. Now Griffith, the Colonel's widow, has this magazine, and she reads this, and she says, my goodness, they're talking about my husband. And so she gets the word back to this man in France, and now he has the correct information. He makes a new plaque, and here he's got it right. The American Colonel Welburn B. Griffith. And so that is now <clears throat> on the building, on the spot where the Colonel died. So now the Griffith family is involved in this, and they are invited back to Shark for a memorial and, uh, at, the, at the Shark Cathedral. And so in 1995, which was the 51st anniversary of his death, they had this memorial, and uh, they played the American National Anthem on the Great Organ in Shark Cathedral, the first time in its 850-year history. Fantastic thing. And so the, the canon there, the, the dean of the cathedral, uh, made a memorial speech. And here's, I think, a beautiful quote uh, made, written by a French author. It says, the only tomb worthy of a hero is in the hearts of a living. I think that's a very poignant uh, inscription. Colonel Griffith received uh, these two medals, uh, the uh, Distinguished Service Cross, the number two, uh, the second highest uh, decoration in the American Army, and also Silver Star. Uh, Colonel Griffith definitely was my hero. Uh, he taught me all the great virtues of life. He was like my father figure, since my own father was several thousand miles away from me during these days, and I was still a boy, 19, 20, 21 years old. 
And so he taught me the, <clears throat> the great virtues of life. Uh, we got to move on quickly. Uh, we, we spent the winter of 44, 45 in the schoolhouse in Thienville, France. That's just south of Luxembourg. And uh, the, the people in Luxembourg decided to have uh, celebrate their liberation day. And, and our 20th Corps liberated that city. And so we were guests of honor, and they had a big parade. And you can see all these, uh, these things happening. There's the mayor with uh, our general. And uh, the French army was there. And just a fantastic uh, thing that happened. <clears throat> I met the, the, this man who holds the archives of the city of Fanville. He took me into the archives and showed me all kinds of books and information about the 20th Corps during the time we lived there. Uh, uh, we toured this, the, the schoolhouse too, and the superintendent of the schoolhouse showed me around, and here is the main corridor in this schoolhouse, and here is a plaque dedicated to the 20th Corps. It's an amazing thing. You can see our, our flag next to the French flag. So the French students go past this every day when they walk down the corridor. Uh, we stopped at a lunchroom where their kids were having lunch, and the superintendent introduced me as the liberator, <laughs> the liberator of their, of their city, and of course they're giving me a uh, lot of applause there. They also named a street in Theonville, 20th Corps Boulevard, and we were in, in, in Theonville two years ago, and I found out now there's a street called General Walker Street. So our, our unit is really publicized quite a bit there. <clears throat> Just north of Thienville, about 30 miles, is the city of Luxembourg. And outside the city of Luxembourg is another American National Cemetery, the Luxembourg one. Uh, there are 5,000 graves there. And, and the reason I'm showing this is because this is where General Patton is buried. And uh, you, it's interesting because here, you see, here's the grave itself, uh, the, the single grave at the head of the cemetery, uh, General Patton, there's his headstone. And originally he was buried along with all the other boys here. And in, in American cemeteries, uh, military cemeteries, the rule is there's no regard for rank. So a general can be buried next to a private. Rank means nothing, we are all American soldiers. Now, and so Patton was buried here in the middle of the cemetery someplace, but there was so much traffic to his grave from tourists that uh, they, they destroyed all the, the, the spot and so on. So they, they moved his grave from out there in the middle to at the head. Also, the German military cemetery is gigantic there. There's uh, almost 11,000. And where that cross is in the middle, that's a huge single grave, a mass grave, where there are a number of soldiers who are unknown. Finally, I want to get to this topic. I know I'm getting late, but <clears throat> you know, oh, it's Saturday, right? <laughs> well, this is a topic that uh, uh, I, I have to talk about, and it's about the Holocaust. And um, this is a place where this is something I could not talk about until about 15 years ago. I was not able to speak about the horrors I had seen. And uh, as I would break up, I, would, I, I, couldn't, I just couldn't talk. But now, I don't know why it is, but I'm able to either suppress it in my brain, I don't know what it is, but I can talk about it as though it's a common, ordinary thing, in which it isn't. So uh, I'm going to try to get this across to you as best I can. The Holocaust, let, let's see what the history of the Holocaust is all about. This is a plan that Hitler had. He called it the Endlösung der Judenfrage, the final solution of the Jewish question. In Hitler's mind, he said to himself that the Jews are the cause of all the troubles in the world, uh, all the economic troubles, the commercial troubles, whatever, due to the Jews. We gotta get rid of the Jews. And so that was his mission. And uh, he sure went at it with a vengeance. And see, so 
there, there was an estimated nine million Jews spread around Europe, Eastern and Western Europe, about nine million. When the war was over, there were only three million Jews left. The difference, six million. Six million Jews were killed, exterminated. It was a horrible, horrible story. So Hitler decided that the way to do it is to, to round up the Jews and, and uh, from where the, the cities where they are living, uh, put them in ghettos, and then from the ghettos, send them to the concentration camps for elimination. So that was his mission. So he set up the very first concentration camp in Dachau. Dachau is just a few miles north of Munich in Bavaria. And this was the prototype of all the concentration camps that, were, that followed. And this happened in, um, Oh, I think 1928 or 1930 or somewhere in there. So it's one of the very first ones. So in these camp, in, in Dachau is where he started medical experiments. He injected diseases into all these, these prisoners to see how the human body would react. He did all kinds of terrible things to the human body. Uh, for instance, he, he would put some of these uh, these prisoners into tanks of cold water, ice water, and, and, and they would be in this water until they died or whatever, and he wanted to see how, how the human body would react to that because his German Luftwaffe were flying at high altitudes where it was cold. So he, this were, these were experiments that he was doing that way. And like I said, he injected these uh, terrible diseases into people and did all kinds of horrible things. So, now, the other uh, concentration camps that followed were big names that you hear nowadays, like Buchenwald and Auschwitz, Poland. Auschwitz was probably the most horrible of all. Uh, it was strictly an extermination camp. And each, at, each, at each of these camps, as you came through the Iron Gate leading into the camp, camp you saw these words, Arbeit macht frei. Every one of the camps has this. That means work makes you free. And so as the, uh, the internees walk through the gate, they say, oh, we, if, if we just work, we'll be free. And that was a total lie, of course, because they never left the camp alive. So here's how the system worked. Uh, up in the left-hand corner, you see a, a boxcar. This is an actual boxcar, which is standing in in uh, Belgium today, uh, that they used to transport these Jews from the ghettos to the concentration camps. Now you can see that's a very small boxcar. Uh, they carried up to 80 people, 80 people in one of these boxcars. So people couldn't uh, uh, couldn't lie down and sleep or anything. They were just jammed in there, and it was like a two or three day journey by train from the ghetto to the concentration camp, wherever they were going. So during the night, people died in these boxcars. In the morning, the train would stop out in the country somewhere. The guards would open up the doors and said, okay, throw out all the dead ones. So all the, the people inside the car who had died that night were thrown out into the field and the train took off. Uh, this is, one of the horrible things that happened. So some of these people didn't make it to the camp in time. Uh, also, if you look at the top right picture and the bottom lower picture here, you'll see each uh, person has on their jacket or shirt, they have a badge. And the badge is the one shown on the right, the German word Jude is Jew. So this is how Hitler made the, made the Jews wear this patch to identify them. So anyone else who walked, uh, saw them on the street said, aha, you're a Jew. And so that is how they humiliated these people. Here are the kinds of internees that Hitler put in these concentration camps, and it's quite a list. Uh, of course, you have the Jews, and he hated the Soviets, so he, he wanted to get rid of Soviet POWs that way. He hated gypsies, the Romans, and of course the Polish people. 
and political prisoners were there, homosexuals and disabled, because you know Hitler wanted the pure Aryan race, and anyone who was uh, disabled or not quite right, out, get out, get rid of them. And Jehovah's Witnesses, which is kind of odd, I think, to see them, their name on here, and of course Protestant Catholic clergy. There were three categories of, of uh, Nazi camps. They had labor, strictly labor camps, strictly extermination camps, and a combination of the two. This is the way the, the inmates lived in the work camps. Uh, those who were able to work, uh, they, they, they lived a horrible life. They worked hard on various things, and they weren't fed very well and they slept in on shelves like this instead of on cots in their barracks. The, the picture on the right is an actual photograph from the German archives, and it shows the uh, scores and scores of people standing there, and if you look closely, you can see everyone is naked, and everyone's hair has been shorn off. Now, Hitler and the camp commandants didn't want any hair. Uh, to burn when they burn these bodies in the crematoriums. Because hair, burned hair, gives off a certain smell. And it can, by, can be identified. So if the, the chimneys in these crematoriums are belching out this smoke and, and human hair was involved, that would float through the atmosphere and someone in some city might smell it and say, aha, something's going on. So they had tons and tons of hair that they, they cut off these people. And so these people are standing here waiting to get into this building. They're told they're going to have a shower. Instead of the shower, when they're once inside, the spigots in the ceiling open up and the cyclone B gas, and this is an actual container, uh, the cyclone B, which they found to be the most efficient gas to kill a person uh, in 20 minutes. It only took about 20 minutes to, to, for a person to die, and they figured that was not too much suffering for them, so go ahead. And it's even said that some, some, of, the, some of the commandants of the, of the chamber, gas chamber here would, would watch through a people as the people inside died, because as this gas came down, it, it filled their lungs, and they, they just kind of collapsed, and in 20 minutes they were dead. These are pictures of uh, the gas chamber and the crematoriums. You can see the ovens there. You can see a lot of charred bodies there. Now, I, I want to tell you about my eyewitness experience uh, of uh, seeing the first Nazi concentration camp that was discovered. Here you see, uh, there's a there's Weimar up there. That's where yeah. we were stationed. Uh, 20th Corps was stationed there. Over here, city of Ordruff, and uh, one of our tank divisions uh, on the morning of April 5th, 1945, liberated the city of Ordruff, and when they came to the outskirts, they ran across this concentration camp full of dead bodies. And this was the very first concentration camp that was discovered because uh, <clears throat> There were rumors that these things existed, but no one had ever seen one. Now, we discovered it. And so Eisenhower went out there immediately, and here is a picture of Eisenhower and, and a couple of the generals. It's hard for me to point out, but this is Ike right here. Next to him is General Bradley. Over on the right-hand side is General Patton, and my general here is General Watt. So they're on this picture. And when Eisenhower saw this, he said, I want eyewitnesses. I want as many eyewitnesses as I can get because he was already looking down the pages of history and was saying to himself, some people aren't going to believe this. And he said, we've got to tell the world what this is. So Ike sent out an order to all of us troops who were in this vicinity to go out there and see this thing. So, I'm an eyewitness, and I have a camera, and so the following pictures are my own pictures that I took. We arrived at Ordruff that one morning, and uh, oh, Ike also said he wanted all the bodies to remain there, and they, st they stayed there for several weeks because he wanted everybody to, to witness this. 
Uh, even members of Congress flew over to witness this. And uh, so here is now the main entrance to the order of concentration camp. You can see barracks on the right, and uh, this is where the men lived. They, they, they lived very terrible lives there. We came to a, the center of the camp here, and I noticed this, this body, this uh, group of dead bodies. What had happened is that when our troops were coming into the city of Ordruf, uh, the commandant and his Nazi guards uh, decided to flee the camp. And, but there were a few men still living, and these were the, those men. And so they ordered these men out <coughs> into the courtyard here, and they had them stand in a, in a circle, and they shot each one in the head. And so there was, the, the men fell over where they were standing, and this is a pile. This was the very first group of dead person people I had seen, and it was just a horrible, horrible thing for me. Then, uh, here at, at the main, uh, the main place where the those buildings are, those are the offices of the commandant and the guards. Uh, I see this contraction. The, what is that? And it turns out those are gallows. So the prisoners who uh, committed a crime, like stealing a loaf of bread maybe, or something like that, or didn't work hard enough, they, were, they stood on that plank there, and at the top of the, the top board, you can see their shackles up there, they shackle their wrists to the top and they beat these men until they died. So that was one of the things. Also, we walked into the, into the, the uh, offices here of the commandant, and I looked at the table, uh, his desk, and I saw a, a book, uh, and I looked closely at the book cover. It was made of human skin. Uh, there was a lamp on the table, and the lampshade was human skin. There was a picture on a wall like this, a framed picture. It was the skin from a man who had a nude, uh, a picture of a nude woman tattooed on his skin. That was framed and put on the wall. And this is a story I don't tell to every group, but you guys know what I'm talking about. There was a little coin purse on the desk. A small coin purse had a drawstring on it. And as I looked at it closely, I discovered it was made from the screw, the man's screw, a coin purse out of his screw. It was shocking, shocking stuff. So what kind of a mindset did these, these, guys, these guards have? Uh, it, it's unbelievable. We move on. There, here are a couple guys who you can see uh, their heads are or, or had been beaten, bludgeoned, and they're lying there in the dirt. Came into this shed, and inside the shed is a potty, uh, uh, all these dead bodies piled up, thrown in there like wood, and you can see how, how skinny they are. The, the, look, at, look at the arms of this one in the foreground here. Uh, it, it's just so small, his ribs are sticking out, and so these are bodies now of prisoners who had died, and they didn't have time yet to put them in the ovens or to bury them in the, in the ground. We went outside the camp here in the meadow, and here all these bodies are lying here, uh, ready to be buried. Uh, there were trenches dug there, and the idea was to throw them into the trenches. Um, but they didn't get that far when our troops overran this place. The officers, uh, our American officers also ordered the town folk of order to go out here and see what was going on in their town. And you can see the horror on the pictures of these town folks as they look at these corpses. And of course they're saying, oh, we had no idea this was happening in our town. Well, are you sure about that? Because that night, the the mayor of Ordruf hanged himself. And so there were people in Ordruf who were making money from this camp, of course. They knew us there. 
Here's another picture showing the town folk looking at this wagon full of corpses, a whole wagon full of them. That night I went back to my unit and I wrote a letter to my brother. I, I didn't think I should write to my mom and dad because it was so horrible. So I said to my brother, use your own judgment. And by the time my letter got home, of course, this was worldwide news because after Ordruf, because Buchenwald, Dachau, and all these other camps that you heard about. And so, but my letter was published in the Clintonville Tribune and also in the Four Wheel Drive News, as it tells your FWD boy tells of German atrocities. So this was early April 1945, just four weeks before the war ended. All kinds of things were happening right after this. On April 12th, President Roosevelt died. And of course, we got a new president in Truman. And on the 30th of April, Hitler committed suicide in his bunker in the right, under the Reichstag. So the war was over. And the Stars and Stripes had all these great headlines, victory, ETO war ends, and so on. And on May 8th, May 8th, VE Day, uh, our army met the Russian army on this bridge across the Inn River in Austria. <clears throat> and the man on the left is General Walker, and the man in the middle is the Russian general. And of course, the war was over, and it was victory, and we were ready to go home. So I have written all this in the book, in my book. I have one, some with me if you're interested. But uh, this is uh, my story, and uh, I hope that I got across to you the fact that yes, the Holocaust did happen. I am an eyewitness. And uh, I'm still carrying out General Eisenhower's orders to tell the story. Thank you so much for listening to me. shared last year for the city of Olakosa. Yes. And I was very happy to see you again. And I don't recall if I had mentioned, I want to mention two things. Number one, my father-in-law, Paul E. Bolzer Jr., who lives in Jamesville, uh, was one of, was a 19-year-old second lieutenant who liberated Dachau. And he only mentioned it once to me in, in the 38 years that I've been married. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't like to watch war movies. He doesn't like to watch the History Channel because he brings these horrors yeah. back. And he said that they crawled up and kissed their feet, he said, which no man should be allowed to do. And he had a very, very hard time living with that for a long time. Oh, yes. And the other thing I wanted to mention, that a lot of people really don't know that Adolf Hitler was fascinated with the guillotine. And in 12 years, he guillotined 16,800 people, more than the French did in 155 years of using that as their punishment. So, he was a very evil person, and um, glad we were. He was a madman, you bet. Yes. yes. And thank you for your service. Well, thank you very much. I'm always grateful for my father in law's service. No, thank you. Well, you're right, and you hear that nowadays that us, us veterans, we, we, nobody talked about it. We came home from the, from the war, and, you know, like I was, where was I, 20, 22, I think, when I got out. <coughs> And I, I wanted an education, so I, I fortunately got that through the GI Bill. And I went on with my life, got married, raised a family, worked. And uh, that's the way it was. But we, we never talked about any, it's just in the f last few years, I think since the honors flight thing started, that uh, now all of a sudden these stories are coming out. And uh, the, the book that I wrote, um, this, uh, it's interesting because um, I have a grandson who, when he was a teenager, uh, early teens, he asked me war stories. So I would tell him a few things now and then. I never told him about the concentration camp. I couldn't talk about that. And he said, Grandpa, I think you should write this down. And so he is a guy who, who started bugging me all the time. Grandpa, how many paragraphs have you written lately? <laughs> that sort of thing. Well, he, I have to thank him for the fact that this is now out. 
And uh, it, it's one of these things I, I really never talked about, never thought about until a couple of years ago. Interesting. Anybody else? Yes, sir. My wife's uncle was uh, from the Battle of the Bulge, mm -hmm. and he never once said a word. Wasn't it true that uh, Adolf Hitler was part Jewish? <laughs> I've heard that? that, yeah. I'm not sure about okay. that. Yeah, I've heard that, too. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of ironic that yeah. he's going about his business with, with him as being part of that. I, you, nobody could understand how his, uh, how his mind worked. I mean, he was really nuts. Very evil, very evil. Yes, sir. Was Orloff the town that uh, Eisenhower ordered the townspeople to bury all of the, the dead? I'm sorry, what was it? Was Orloff the town that Eisenhower buried, uh, ordered the local people to bury all of the dead? I, I know one of the... Oh, I, I'm not sure about that. He ordered the local townspeople and said, we're not cleaning up, you're cleaning it up. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the idea was to, to get these these German citizens involved to see what was going on. But many people were getting wealthy through these concentration camps, and they were Hitler's elite people, like, uh, like the, the mayor of Ordruf. It's an amazing story that he hanged himself that night after he saw this. Mm -hmm. Ordruf, believe it or not, in 92 I lived near that. Uh, I was on the border of East-West Germany for okay. many years. I never made the word off, but I went to Buchenwald a lot. Mm -hmm. Was it, when we used to go to Buchenwald after the wall went down, was it, when you guys ran up on those camps, was it, our crazy thing was the deaf silence around those camps, not even the birds trip. And after 50 years, almost, it's still definitely silent. <coughs> I mean, it, the Russians turned it into a huge memorial. I never made it to Ordorf, but I've heard of it. Well, Ordorf is gone. Yeah, it's nothing there. Completely because gone. when I, in 1994, when I took my wife there, went to Ordorf, they didn't know anything about it. And, and I went to the Chamber of Com or the uh, Tourist Bureau, Tourist Bureau there, and they said, well, it, it's here's a map, you can find your way out there. And went out there, and it's just an open field. Nothing there. And so now people are saying, well, that's too bad that it wasn't saved because these are memorials that really should be saved to tell the world of the evils that were going on. And uh, Buchenwald, I was there last year, as a matter of fact, uh, there, the only thing standing there is the, is the, the one building at the entrance to the, at the entrance to this camp and there's a clock up there, and the clock is at 10 minutes after three or something like that. It's, that's fixed. Apparently that's the time that it was uh, overrun. But there's nothing there. Uh, it's just an open field, and, and there, they have, a, where the barracks used to stand, they now have a, a, a plot, like, like, like a plot like this with stones around it, and each one of those plots now where there was a barracks is where somebody has made a memorial. So you have memorials by uh, certain groups like a Jewish memorial or a, a Croatian memorial or something like that. And uh, that's all you have is a sign there. But uh, um, Dachau, I believe, I, I was at Dachau many years ago, but that's still there. That one's a huge place. Here. Yes, that way. And of course, Auschwitz. Yeah, Auschwitz. You want to go to Auschwitz. Yeah. We weren't allowed there because it was Poland yet. Oh, yeah. It was communist. Mm -hmm. Some U.S. soldiers weren't allowed to do. But that, though, from what I've been told, the people are still so ashamed that they won't even register their cars because of the license. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. So the shame is. Mm -hmm. it, it's, that, though, is a weird place. Yeah. Surreal. There was a question? I was going to elaborate. <coughs> My wife and I were just at, at Dachau in August. Oh. And uh, we got a trip through Germany and Austria. And, uh, that was our first stop on our whole trip, and it was very sobering. Mm -hmm. Actually, after being a history buff and reading about it, seeing the picture standing there. And it, it was the, the, 
the feeling of death was still there, <clears throat> the quietness, and yes. the, the feeling of the people in Germany is kind of interesting, and Austria, right now, because it's been memorialized, and you say, like, the other camp is completely gone. Well, there's a lot of people now, and that, that number is growing, that, that want it to all go away. You want a lot of these places torn down. It's been memorialized long enough. You want it out of our sight. <clears throat> and the, the city of Dachau is kind of, it used to be more open country, and of course, over the decades, it's now a densely populated area. Yeah. This is like sitting right in the middle of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but there was thousands of people visiting the Gateway area. It's a huge museum there. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a big feeling there that a lot of these memorials, they don't want to be I reminded guess, yeah. anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, but people who've been there said that as you walk into the main lobby or something, there's a huge picture and it's order. Mm -hmm. That's amazing to me that well, it was the first one discovered. It's amazing to see the maps too and they, to see the amount of constant. You know, we always hear of Auschwitz and Dachau. There was... There were many. There was lots of them, yes. Over 30 yes. Camps Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. The enigma was Sheen that you spoke mm -hmm. of, but the, there was a German sub that was captured by the Americans, yep. and it had a machine mm -hmm. there that they were able to get a hold of. But the Americans made sure that it was never made known that that, that sub was captured because the Germans would know that, that they had a machine. So the Germans thought all these years that that sub had actually going down. Uh, the crew was gone. The, the Americans got there. They didn't know what happened to the crew. But the ship stayed afloat. The submarine. Yes. Uh, and then the Americans kept that a secret because if they knew that the sub had been captured, they would know that yes. the machine turned into place. You're absolutely right, yeah. That's exactly what happened. And that really helped them. Yeah. <coughs> Quite a subject. It was kind of the last war, too, that people wanted to get involved. I can remember at that time, those people who graduated from high school and so on, they would, they would volunteer. Oh, yes, uh, yes, so, lots. Uh, they were, I, I don't want to say popular, but it was certainly a well-supported yeah. uh, work. <clears throat> well, it was the thing to do. All my buddies from high school, they were all in service. And, uh, it was a choice. Yeah. yeah. And you want to serve your country, you know. There was a tremendous amount of patriotism in those days. Um, and it's funny, when I talk to high school kids or other students, they are extremely interested. They are fascinated by what I'm talking about in my pictures. And uh, they ask intelligent questions, too. I'm, I'm so, so impressed with these kids nowadays. So I think there's hope of the next generation that, uh, and I think there's more patriotism is showing up too. I have that feeling. But there's been a time in the recent years where I think, where is America's patriotism? It's gone. But maybe it's not. Okay, anybody else? Fascinating subject, I think. Oh, yes, sir. I've often said, and I would invite your opinion, when we got rid of the draft, America lost some of its conscience. We now have a paid armed forces. I'm not taking anything away from what they do, but we don't have a draft, so people are not in as involved as they should be. That's one way to look at it, I guess. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. We'll only have it on uh, video if you want to show people on the internet. We'll have it up on our on our video site that we've been capturing. You. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, just a reminder: we've got a bunch of sign-up places uh, this Wednesday night. Uh, come out and learn about uh, El Salvador's history through um, the Archbishop Romero, and um, his story is incredible, um, and, and uh, it's really well done in this movie. So. That's Wednesday night, and I think uh, 
Mike's even doing the food again, so. Are you doing the food? Yeah, there's too stuff that's here. By the way, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be egg sandwiches and uh, on a bed of gravy, right? There's some fruit on the top. It's the only place we get our bacon is right here, right? Uh, but thank you to Mike. Mike is the one that brings in all the food every time and supplies us with it. So uh, he does a lot of work getting that in. We had a whole bunch of guys that also helped to cook it. We're here at 6 this morning. Uh, we want to let them take a break since they were working so hard to prepare the food for us. So if you can help with cleanup in the kitchen and putting the chairs back um, for our adult ed tomorrow, that would be great. Um, but sign up for the guest house activities that we have going on. We're going to do some plantings. And um, we haven't quite announced this yet. It's just going to start coming out in the bulletin. But, um, but I've had a couple people ask me this morning, and since it kind of ties in with Germany, uh, we are doing a Germany tour next uh, April, May. So that's 2015, uh, where um, I don't know if you know what the big anniversary is, the 500th anniversary. We got the Luther Scholars here. Uh, so it's the 500th anniversary of the posting of the 95 Theses. And so this is a big time in uh, Luther, uh, Luther history. And um, so we're going to be doing uh, a major chunk of the trip around those spots. And also then going to Auschwitz. Um, we will be going there and uh, doing some World War II um, studying as well. So, and this is um, done in a very nice way. Our tour company does a great job um, putting the uh, hotels together. So we have, it's essentially late April, early May, back by Mother's Day. You can't do a trip if you go over Mother's Day, right? <laughs> There's some unwritten law about that. Father's Day, it's not a problem, but uh, I can say that to this group, right? Um, <laughs> no other group, though. Um, but if you do want to see where we're going, you can get the sheet on the table, so. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming out, guys. Um, and uh, if you can stay and help us clean up, we'd appreciate it. Have a great day, and thanks again. And again, if you want to post, you're up front. I don't remember if it was Alan Ching that asked me, but she said that they are people that are in the